Good to see you this morning. Y'all doing good? Man, the presence of the Lord is so beautiful. He is here. He is here. Amen? Y'all looking good? You awake? Uh I feel like I need a little more energy. Are you awake today? Okay, come on. Uh, When Mary was leading in that last section of worship and she just started singing about healing, I had such a strong awareness that the healer was here, that he wanted to heal in the room. And I I just want to do this real quick. I know we gave an opportunity in ministry time, but how many would just be here and you'd say, I need healing in my body right now? Okay, look at those hands. Would you put your hand on somebody who has their hand lifted? Keep your hand lifted. I just want to just ask the Lord to do that right now in the room. Um, How many know we don't have to do it during ministry time or while music's playing? The presence of the Lord is here. And um, I just had such a strong sense Wednesday night. I just believe God was healing so many people in the room. And so I just just ask in Jesus' name right now um, that healing would flow in this place. Stretch out your hand, Lord, through our hands and heal. I, just, I pray for arthritis to go in Jesus' name. I pray for um, physical pain to go in Jesus' name. Um, I pray even right now for mental anguish to be silenced and cast out and thrown out from your people. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, that you are the healer and you are here doing a work. And I thank you that you're, you're, you're moving in this way today. Thank you that you're moving in this way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. These signs shall follow and accompany those who believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. How many are thankful for this? I am too. I am too. Well, we're going to continue today in the Sermon on the Mount. (laughs) I thought we'd get at least one, yeah. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, greatest sermon ever preached from the greatest preacher who ever lived, Jesus. And uh, this entire sermon, um, as we've seen and we've talked about, he's describing what human life is what human community looks like when we come under the rule in the reign of God. Um, he shows us what the new humanity looks like, what uh, it looks like when heaven breaks in and the kingdom of God comes and invades our lives and invades our, our entire world. And what we found as we had been in the Beatitudes is that kingdom life, this kingdom life, the blessed life, looks radically different. Looks radically different, radically different from uh, the life the religious people were living, and it looks radically different from the ways and means in which the world is living. It's an entirely different way of life. Did you know you're called to an indifferent way of life? Entirely different way of life. Kingdom people, Jesus people, are to be entirely different from others. Turn to somebody and say, you look different. Jesus' followers don't take their cue from the culture. Jesus' followers don't take their cue from the people around them. Jesus' followers take our cue from Jesus. We we walk out life, we do life in the way of Jesus because he is the way, he is the truth. He, he is the life. And if there's one central theme, uh, one, one main point, I think, of the entire Sermon on the Mount, I believe it's this. It's a call to be radically different from the world. To be radically different from the world. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are supposed to be different. Okay, turn to the other one now. Say, you are supposed to be different. Some of you are like, yes, you are. You're very different. Say this, there isn't a paragraph in these three chapters that we call the Sermon on the Mount. There isn't a a paragraph that doesn't emphasize the stark contrast between the way of the world and the way of Jesus and his kingdom. 
Every, every, every paragraph, you just see it over and over again. Jesus is saying, I'm showing you a counterculture way to live in the world. And you don't have to leave the world to live it. You actually can live it in the world. You actually get to be something totally different in the world. And leading up to Easter, um, we spent about eight weeks in the Beatitudes. You remember them? Hopefully you didn't forget them. Um, which is at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So um, the, the context of that entire Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes. That's how it starts. And we're going to pick up right where we left off um, in Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to start here with verse 11 where Jesus says this. He says, Blessed are you when others revile you. If you don't know what revile means, it means to put you down. Blessed are you when others put you down and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, verse 13, where we're going to focus Today, he says, you, everybody say you, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says, you, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they, they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." Now, put yourself in the place of those first listeners that were hearing Jesus in this moment, who heard him speak these words, these powerful words on that hillside. Twelve disciples. Um, he just called them to follow him. They're ordinary folks. How many like ordinary folks? I love ordinary people. None of them are the who's who among the Jews. None of them occupy high-ranking Places in the religious establishment. They are ordinary Joes. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> ordinary Joshes. Ordinary, you know, Marys. Ordinary people just like you and me. They're ordinary. They're really a, a rather ragamuffin crew of people. But something was happening to them as they began to follow Jesus. Something was, something was happening in them. Something was happening to them. They were, they were being changed slowly from the inside out. They were, they were being changed slowly but surely. And the good news was getting a hold of them. And here Jesus is on that mountain, a mountainside. And he's explaining the implications of this good news to them. And he's telling them, here's what my people are going to look like. They're going to they're, they're, they're look like merciful people. They're going, to be, they're going to look like poor in spirit. They're going to look like pure in heart. They're going, to be, they're going to look like people that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're going to be peacemakers. What's he talking about? This new humanity is the beatitude people. And as he's looking into the eyes of this group of misfits, he's calling them to significance. He's speaking purpose. He's speaking identity into them. And he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A few weeks ago, um, our family watched, again, the movie The Help. Have any of you seen that movie? I'll tell you what, that movie makes me cry and it makes me laugh really hard. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to go into the laughing parts. But 
Um, it's a movie that's set through the civil rights movement, and it focuses on two African-American maids. How many have seen The Help? Just so, Okay, so a good amount of you, yeah. Two African-American maids and their experience as The Help. And uh, I'll never forget this moment in the movie where the main character, um, Abilene, y'all remember Abilene? Um, she's a black n- a nanny that, that says these words to a four-year-old white girl that she's the nanny of um, because this little girl's mom is really just not caring for her well, not, not loving her well. And she looks at this little girl every day and she says these words. Some of you will know what I'm talking about right away. She says, you is kind. You remember that? She says, you is smart. You is important. You is kind. And every day, this little girl, as she comes to nanny her, and, and, and this little girl's like kind of neglected, she says, you is kind. You is smart. You is important. And as I read the words of Jesus, it's like I hear him saying it like that to us. You is salt. (laughs) You is light. (laughs) You is important. You is important. And you know what, what hits me about it is that he tells them who they are before they are. He, he, he speaks who they are before they actually have become who they are. And what's interesting is he doesn't say, he doesn't say you will be salt one day when you arrive. He doesn't say you will be light one day when you, you know, ascend to some place. He says right here, right now, you are salt, you are light. Before you heal the sick, before you preach the gospel before you do anything. Jesus is looking at this ragtag group of people gathered, and he says, you, the people that I love, that I left heaven to come for, and I love you so much, the people that I've, that I've called blessed, you in whom the reign of God has come, you are the salt. You are the light of the world. As I was digging into this a bit, I... I found that the Romans um, had a saying at that time that said this, there is nothing more useful than salt and sun. There's nothing more useful than salt and sun. Salt and light were and are um, indispensable household commodities, right? In Jesus' day, every home, however rich or poor it was, um, both uh, needed salt and light, So what is Jesus doing here in saying this? Jesus is communicating something. How many know if Jesus is communicating something, we should pay attention? He's strategically communicating with these two metaphors how incredibly important these beatitude people are in the world. They're as important as salt and light. The world can get along without a lot of things. But according to Jesus, hear this, the world cannot get along without beatitude people. We often talk about salt and light outside of the context of the beatitudes, but the beatitudes flow right into his talk about salt and light. They are connected and interchangeable. What does he mean by salt and light? First, I think he means, obviously, how they would have heard it is, wow, we're really useful. We're really important. I think the need for light is pretty obvious to all of us, but why salt, right? I I don't think that would have been at the top of our list as Americans living in 2024. In Bible times, though, before refrigeration had been invented, salt was used as a preservative. How How many are just thankful for the refrigerator? Yeah, me too. Salt was used to keep meat fresh. Salt was used to prevent meat from decaying, from spoiling. They'd rub the meat with salt, and it would preserve it for a long time. Salt arrested the spread of bacteria. Think about that. It was also commonly used as an antiseptic to stop the spread of germs. It was very effective in fighting 
decay, and it was very effective in fighting the spread of infection and, and disease. And so in choosing these two words, salt and light, Jesus is letting us in on something that happens when human society is left to itself. Left to itself, human society goes to decay and darkness. Society left to itself has the tendency to spoil and rot. Left to itself, it deteriorates. You know, the Apostle Paul in, in Romans chapter 1, he paints a sobering picture of what happens when society suppresses the truth and rejects God. I'm not going to read the, the passage now, but, but the heart of it is, is it deteriorates. It, it's, it's a heartbreaking chapter, really. You should read it later on when you go home before bed. It'll make you really happy so you go to sleep. But it's, a, it's a, I'm joking. Actually, read the Psalms before bed. Glorify Jesus and then, then read the Romans 1 tomorrow morning. It'll be good. It's, it's a heartbreaking chapter about what happens when God is rejected. And when values and standards... Um, are, are, are rejecting God, what happens is there's this decline um, until it becomes utterly corrupt. See, when humans reject what they know of God, God gives them up to their own distorted desires, right? G gives humanity up to their perverted passions until society just starts stinking. It's what we see so much of right now, right? Right? Wrong is right, right is wrong. As long as it feels good, you know, truth is, is, is judged as old-fashioned. And one of the greatest ironies, I think, um, of history is that what we call um, the period of history when God is taken out of the center of human thinking, we call that the Enlightenment. And what we see throughout all of history is this inertia towards decay. Um, it, it, and it's, it's the consequences of humanity's decision to go it alone and try and build this world without God. <laughs> and I want to tell you, um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It never has, and it never will work. It, it doesn't work in my life. When I go it alone without God, I want to tell you, it doesn't work. When you go it alone without God, it doesn't work. And it's, it's the case for all of humanity. When God is left out of the equation, society spoils and decays. Now, I'm not here to curse the darkness, but how many know it's important that we don't pretend that everything's great? Jesus is making it clear when this happens, left to ourselves like meat, we spoil. But the good news is that what Jesus is announcing here is that the living God intervenes in the world, and guess what? He provides salt and light. And as much as it was a surprise to these guys hearing this in that moment, I believe it's a surprise to us. And he says, hey, you're the salt, you're the light of the world. Guess what? It's you. And like salt gets rubbed into meat to stop it from going bad, our assignment is to be rubbed into every layer of society to stop it from going bad. <laughs> you can't blame unsalted meat for going bad. It, has, it, 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 it can't do anything but go bad. The real question to ask is, where's the salt? Where's the salt? I thought you looked like you were with me, but maybe not. Where's the salt? Right? It's not the meat's fault. Where's the salt? The implied truth here is that we're set in society to hinder the process of decay. In fact, because we are here, because the Beatitude people are alive and well, and here, the opposite of decay will happen. God intends for us 
to penetrate the world as salt. This is good preaching, Josh. (laughs) Jesus isn't calling us to only remain in salt shakers with other salt. Right? Like, like you don't pour, you know, when you're making your meal, like, like I, we had, uh, what did we have last night? I can't remember. It was so good, babe. Whatever you made. <laughs> it was, it was so good. But like, you know, you don't, you don't take the, the chicken and put it here and the salad and then the green beans. And then you put a, you know, pour a pile of salt over here on your plate. That would be, that's what we do. That's called church. Whoa, you know, you know what I mean? Like, like, and church is good. We are, we are not to forsake the assembling and the gathering. This is very, very important, but we aren't supposed to just stay in a pile on a plate. We aren't supposed to just stay in a, a salt shaker, right? Um, no, salt gets sprinkled out over the whole meal to what? Bring flavor. To bring, everybody say Flavor flavor. This is really here what Jesus is getting at, okay? Verse 13, this is what he's getting at. But if the salt has lost its taste, if it's lost its flavor, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under feet. See, you and I are not only to preserve society, but we are supposed to be adding flavor, Some of you are spicy, too. (laughs) Salt enhances flavor. I know about this. We've taken salt out of our our food in our house for three months. And I'll tell you what, the first couple weeks, I really missed it. And then we started adding it in a little bit. And I'll tell you what, the food comes alive with salt. It enhances flavor. And he's saying, that's what I want you to do. I want you to enhance flavor where you're mixed in with flavor, not just any kind of flavor, God's flavor. God's flavor. He's saying, I want to sprinkle you all throughout society to bring flavor. Every sphere, education, government, marketplace, the office place, the grocery aisles, the home, the family. I want to sprinkle you out to bring impact to every layer of life. The, the, the Hebrew and the Aramaic word here for, for tasteless means this. It really hit me. It means this, to become foolish. Tasteless. It actually means to become foolish. What's Jesus saying? He's saying this. A disciple that has lost their saltiness has become foolish, useless. So think about this with me. So if salt without flavor is foolish and useful for nothing, then what is salt with flavor? The implied truth here is wisdom. Wisdom. A foolish disciple has no kingdom influence on the world. That's what Jesus is getting at. But a salty disciple, everybody say salty. Salty Salty disciple adds flavor. A salty disciple is actually useful. They're not just off in a corner kind of trying to live in a bubble. They're actually useful in society, adding flavor, adding wisdom to the world around us. We bring God's wisdom the wisdom of heaven to the world. I I love this. James 3 just came to me as I was just in this. And and listen to what what, what the Bible says is the wisdom of God, the wisdom of heaven. Verse 17, it says this, but but the wisdom from above, from heaven, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Do you see what's getting connected here? That sounds an awful lot like the Beatitude people. 
the wisdom of heaven are these things. They're the same characteristics of the Beatitude people. The Beatitude people bring the wisdom of heaven to the culture. The, the Beatitude people bring, through the influence that we have been given, the wisdom of heaven to the culture. Whatever influence you have, it's been given by God. I want to tell you that. It's where he's sprinkling you out into the world. You're a sprinkler. The success you have, the influence that you carry, I want to tell you, is for kingdom purpose. How many of you have influence? Okay, I need to work with this. Because if you don't think you have influence... You're missing. How many have influence? That that should be every single hand. You know what? In Instagram culture, we think influence is like thousands and millions. I want to tell you, the kingdom of heaven, the influence is just one. So, how many have influence? I'm doing this till every hand is raised. I mean, we, I, I'm, I've got all day. You have influence. And that influence has been given to you for kingdom purpose. The, 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 the success you have, the influence you carry is, is, is intentional. You didn't get that promotion. You didn't get that place of influence just so you could climb a ladder for yourself. It was a promotion. It was influence to release an even greater measure of his kingdom here on earth. What would happen if we actually started viewing life that way? The success that I have, there's a reason for it. God is giving that success. The people that are drawn to you are looking to you. Whether they know it or not, they're looking for the wisdom of heaven that you carry. And that influence that you have with them is so that you can release the heart of Jesus into their lives. You can release the wisdom of heaven. You thought they just liked you. You thought, um, you know, you were cool. You're not as cool as you thought. You've been given favor so you can bring flavor. Right there. That's a zinger. It's going all over Instagram and Facebook today. I'm just kidding. It came to me. I don't know if I'm sure someone else has said it. You've been given favor so you can bring flavor. Church, we need to wake up to this. We need to wake up to this. We need to recognize this. That as kingdom people, we carry the presence of Jesus. We carry wisdom. We, we carry flavor. We carry something that should attract people. If you're walking around and you're like, oh, I'm just detracting everyone in the name of the Lord, you might reconsider. We'll talk about that a little bit. Chemists say this, salt cannot stop being salt. In other words, Chemically, it cannot lose its saltiness, salt. But this is, this is what I learned. It can, however, become ineffective. Salt can. If, um, if, it's, if it becomes ineffective, um, it becomes ineffective by being contaminated by mixture. Mixing with other things. Mixture with impurities. And then it becomes useless. In fact, it can actually become dangerous. Our effectiveness on society as believers depends on our distinct difference from the world. I want to say that again. Our, our effectiveness on society as believers, it actually depends on our distinct differences from the world. 
I love what Dr. Lloyd-Jones said. He says this, I think we got this quote. The, the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. It is then that the world is made to listen to her message, though it may hate it at first. Salt creates thirst. Salty disciples of Jesus make people thirsty for Jesus. I want to ask you this question today. Who is thirsty because of you? Who is thirsty because of how you're living? When, when we live our lives in such a way that, that, that people want what we have, it creates a thirst for what we have. They will want to know, why do you have so much hope? Why do you treat us with such kindness and with such honor and with such respect? Like, why do you not retaliate when you are attacked in that conversation? What's going on? Why is that tragedy that you're going through not robbing you of joy? Why is that tragedy not robbing you of peace? Why are you so different? They should see, church, that we are radically different. The warning that, that Jesus is giving us, though, is that if we are indistinguishable from the world, guess what? We're useless. We might as well be discarded like salt, saltless salt thrown out. I want to ask you, do people recognize that you are different? And, and by different, I mean Jesus different. Some are like, yeah, they do. <laughs> Jesus uses the second metaphor, light. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I want to read it again. Nor do people light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. How many know that shining in your own home is really important? Sometimes shining in your own house can be the most challenging. I wouldn't know anything about that, but <laughs> just kidding. He said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see, so they may see your good works. Give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Here's what I tell you today, church. God's plan for darkness is the people of God shining bright. The darker it gets, the more pronounced light becomes. If the world is getting darker, it's because somebody has turned down the lights. If the ones called to shine are not shining, the result is darkness. But Jesus says to us, he says to them, but he says to us, you are the light of the world. It's one of the most extraordinary statements Jesus made about his church. You are a city of light that cannot be hidden. A city, a city made up of individual lights shining bright together, each one making a small impact by collectively together making a significant impact that cannot be hidden. You think that little thing tomorrow at work, that little exchange where you have an opportunity to respond in the ways of Jesus or the ways of the world, you think that's not significant? I want to tell you, that's significant as you going out and voting. That'll preach. What's he saying? He's saying, you're over there. She's over there. I'm over here. What are we doing? We're shining. You walk into a, a pitch black room and you turn on the lights and you see what happens. What happens? Light is so superior to darkness. Instantly, darkness is gone. Jesus says, this is what's going to happen as you shine. They will see your good works, your good deeds, and give glory to God. The good works conveys the eight qualities of the Beatitude people. Our good works are to reveal the realities of a different kingdom. It isn't just words we say. It's the life we live. Can I hear an amen on that? It isn't just talking. 
It's actually the life that we live. He says, they're going to see what you do. Who are they? The world. The world will see your good works and give glory to your father. When you overcome evil with good, when you return a harsh word with a kind word, when you speak the truth in love, when you do what's right, when everyone else is doing what's wrong, when you're the best worker in your company, they will see. When you don't enter into to, to negative conversation and gossip like others do, they are going to see. When we res- refuse to waver from righteousness and truth in the midst of great deception in the land and great wickedness, and we suffer for it, they are going to see. When you refuse to bow to the spirit of the age and conform to the culture, they're going to see. Jesus is saying, the world is supposed to see something entirely different coming out of you. And here's what Jesus is letting us in on. Sometimes your good works, sometimes your saltiness, sometimes the brightness that comes from you will cause people to give glory to God. And also something else can happen, which we read at the beginning, verse 11. Sometimes your light shining will cause people to insult you. Sometimes you walking in truth will cause people to curse you. Sometimes you standing in the place of righteousness and not bowing down to that thing or that mindset or that spirit of the age will cause persecution people to say false things about you because of me that's what he says i want to tell you guys one of those two things is going to happen second timothy 3 12 says this so powerful all who desire to live a godly life in christ jesus will be persecuted make no mistake If we truly are shining, this is going to come. It might come in your own family. It might come in your church. It might come in friends. It might come through all kinds of ways. I'll tell you what, it's definitely going to come through the world. If we truly live different from the world, counterculture, godly lives, I just want to tell you, I want to warn you, because Jesus is warning us. How How many love it when you get a good warning from someone? He's saying, hey, you're going to be persecuted. When you do what's right, when everyone else is doing what's wrong, you will be persecuted. When you push back against that spirit of the age, the confusion of the age with truth and the way of Jesus, there's going to be pushback. But get this, great is your reward. Great is your reward. Great is your reward. If the world gets darker, it's because somebody has turned down the lights. He didn't say you're the light of the church. We're shining bright in here this morning. He said, you're the light of the world. And if the beatitude people called to be the light are hiding in the church and don't get out in the world to shine, it's going to grow dark. If the beatitude people do not look and live different from the world, guess what's going to happen? Society is going to grow dark. And I wonder sometimes how many of us are asking the wrong question about what's, what's happening in our world, especially in our nation, right? So we see society getting darker and we ask the question, what's gone wrong with the world? And we point the fingers at the world. Think about this. When meat goes bad, you don't blame the meat. You dang meat. No, you ask, where's the salt? When a room goes dark, you don't blame the room. You say, where's the light? When a society that was was once under the influence of Christianity begins to rapidly decline in a moral decay, you don't blame the society. You ask, where in heaven's name is the church? And I don't say that at you. I say that at us. Where's the church? We're the people of God. We're the people of God. And I don't mean getting on some news channel and just letting them have it. I mean tomorrow, where are the people of God? Where are the people of God? 
in the marketplace. Where are the people of God? You know, in, in the stores and in the, in the conversations, where are the salt and where are the light? Where are we? How are we showing up? I wish I had another half hour because I'm ready to... Ugh. But this guy comes up here. I bless those who persecute me. I want to read this out of the message. <laughs> what we just read, I want to read it again. I love how the message reads this. Matthew 5, 14. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Be opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Here's what I want to tell you guys. He's saying, my plan for darkness is light and you're my plan. You're my plan. Turn to somebody and say, you're the plan. You're the plan. Not, not the guy with the mic, not the guy with all the followers on YouTube or, or the, the, the news guy. You're the plan. You're the plan. He's really clear about this. This isn't a secret to be kept. This isn't a private kind of faith. Just between you and God. What what God does in you, God wants to do through you. He says, you're the light of the world. And we're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. I'm putting you on a hilltop, a light stand, and I'm going to give you places of influence. Why? So you can shine. Nobody lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. It defeats the purpose. He's saying, but as you shine, your light is going to dispel the darkness. To close with this, Bonhoeffer, he says this. He says, a community of Jesus, which seeks to hide itself, has ceased to follow him. We are light. And so we have to refuse to conceal our light in any way, whether by sin, mixture, contamination, or compromise, or by laziness or fear. Whatever space you've been given, it's space to shine. Stand with me this morning. I've got one minute. We have this recap meeting on Monday mornings, and they go through the time. And I can never believe how much time I took. I, I rebuke it, but the numbers still stay on the screen. And then I have to face them every Monday morning. Hold on a second. He's getting ready to like release the horses <laughs> saddle up your horses we got a trail to blaze oh that actually works for the sermon doesn't it we did not plan that that was so great Tyler hold it here's what I want to tell you as we walk out of here don't underestimate the influence you've been given in the spaces that you've been given. Every believer is given responsibility to bring the light to society in each generation. So I close with this simply. You is salt. You is light. And Jesus says, you is important. more important than you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be dramatic moments, but most of the moments 
aren't going to be everyday moments where you get to walk out and be the beatitude people. And I want to tell you, the world will change because of it. If you want to be that, would you just lift your hands and pray over you as we close? In Jesus' name. I, I just ask for just a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses. I thank you for fresh touch from heaven today. Fresh power from on high. Not to do this in the flesh, but to be a work of the Spirit where we are literally glowing out of this place where we get sprinkled all over and we're shining so bright. I pray in Jesus' name for a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit, a fresh filling of power. I pray when you go to sleep tonight, you would have an encounter with the Holy Spirit on your bed, in your room tonight, that he would just take you up that he would just take you up and show you things that you could never know, things you could never see. In the spirit realm, you'd be able to see what's really going on and you'd walk out of that place of encounter and you would touch the world. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I love you. Don't miss Wednesday night. I'm telling you, it's going to be beautiful. Have an amazing week. We love you.